Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, tonight's speaker would normally be the chairman, which is why someone who is not normally the chairman is now the chairman. That is me, Bob Layson. Uh, speaker for tonight is David McDonough. Um, both of us uh, joined the Libertarian Alliance in about 1979, we think. Yes. And we are both moving towards 79, but not, not just yet. Um, the topic of tonight's uh, talk, address, lecture, is does free trade cause famine? Thank you. Well, thank you for coming along. Uh, the Trotskyites in the uh, 1960s used to be make a lot of fuss about cash traps. I used to wonder why, because uh, the old Marxist paradigm, which they're supposed to have shared, uh, is supposed to be get through capitalism as soon as possible, and uh, and you get to socialism. Uh, but uh, the Trotskyites used to still make a fuss about cash traps, and this was more or less resisting the onset of, of the market economy of capitalism. Uh, and uh, they had this idea that cash props was uh, terrible, causing famine and so on. And it seemed a bit of a fad to me. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I was quite surprised to find uh, last year that it, it was coming up on, on the uh, internet in various uh, socialist groups that I was arguing on. Uh, on the internet, in internet lists. And uh, so I looked up a few uh, articles and I found it was in the internet articles. Now, I've often said that the internet is full of uh, libertarian uh, or liberal... Uh, posters, but the actual content on the internet itself, on the web page and so on, is, is not as libertarian as you'd like. Uh, yeah, and this cash props uh, business, this case against cash props and that they cause people to starve is quite uh, widespread. So anyway, I thought that uh, I would uh, give a talk on it eventually. Uh, and I was looking through Adam Smith and uh, I thought Adam Smith made a number of, uh, uh, he had a number of theories uh, one, he had the idea that the, the market, uh, as it progresses, uh, pushes towards long-term equality, although it has short-run inequalities, and the short-run inequalities owing to short-run phenomena, uh, forever appear such that, uh, you know, that you never will get complete equal wages or complete equality of profits and so on, uh, because of this short-run phenomenon like new goods, new innovations, new inventions and so on. And these will go on, and these actually, these innovations tend to uh, ensure that the long run movement towards equality of prices is an equal, uh, is a equalizing up rather than so it's, uh, rather than a, a leveling down as many of these politicians want us to do uh, so uh, and uh, Smith also has the uh, argument that uh, imperialism is a complete uh, uh, complete mess complete model and uh, uh, utterly uneconomic and uh, owing only to backward ignorance what we might call, uh, using game theory, a negative sum game. Uh, and Smith has the uh, idea that free trade, of course, is the solution to famine, uh, which is contrary to what the trust guys I mentioned earlier on. And uh, he also has uh, the idea that slavery uh, doesn't pay, that it's uh, you know, a bit like uh, imperialism. It's uh, emerged owing to the uh, fact that people are vain and uh, want to rule over others. Uh, but it costs them a hell of a lot to do so, and in the long run, uh, uh, the market will get rid of slavery. Uh, now, uh, of course, a book came out on the slavery issue uh, by uh, J. E. Kearns uh, around about 1861, uh, called the slave trade, saying that uh, the Civil War was almost bound to be lost by the uh, South, and that uh, you know, basically slavery was on the way out anyway, with or without the Civil War, because of what Smith said. And uh, I think that's uh, roughly right. You know, I think, uh, you know, I think slavery is uh, uh, even Karl Marx, by the way, endorsed this in Capital. In fact, he even quotes uh, Karl's "The Slave Power," and uh, says that it's quite right that capitalism will get rid of slavery um, because of it's, there's no profit in it, rather than because it's a moral thing. Uh, you know, these two things needn't clash, but uh, you know, of course, this is a, uh, a popular view that profit is uh, it's probably immoral. It's probably a popular view. Uh, but of course, uh, I think this is based on, on ignorance of what profit is. Profit is basically the all mark of uh, a public service, uh, or at least uh, serving some members of the public. Uh, if they uh, actually buy the goods and the goods make a profit, then that means they've been successfully served by the market. And of course, there is a, a, as the, the libertarian case is just that the market uh, serves the public, whereas the state uh, uh, rules the public and tends to abuse the public as well. Uh, now. Uh, 
all these ideas, as you have mentioned, there's a, there's a, a third one of, uh, uh, of Smith's. Uh, mentioned imperialism, slavery, uh, inequality, uh, famine. Uh, th th there's some other ideas in Smith's as well, which have been reversed by uh, the colleges and by uh, people in the colleges. Uh, uh, you know, they, almost, they hold uh, the reverse of all these things that Smith held. But I think Smith is right on all these things. And uh, t tonight I'm going to deal just with the, the one aspect that I've mentioned, which is uh, whether free trade causes famine or not. I think the uh, the people in the colleges, especially the historians, uh, uh, have got, to, and a lot of journalists have got the idea that it, it probably does cause famine, that the cash crops is a bad thing, and that uh, uh, living from hand to mouth uh, uh, you know, without uh, trading crops is a good thing because uh, it, uh, it, it starves off famine. But of course, the problem of famine itself <coughs> arose about seven to five thousand years ago with, with the rise of agriculture. Uh, what we have with the rise of agriculture is that the uh, people uh, depended on a harvest which came roughly once a year. And this meant that uh, if the harvest failed, they, they had some trouble. Uh, and uh, they had to various things of drying the food and salting the food and so on, trying to preserve the food was, uh, and that getting uh, fat years to go over lean years was part of the uh, solution. Uh, but the uh, obvious real solution to this, of course, is access to harvests that don't fail around the world. And we, uh, the way we get access to uh, harvests that don't fail around the world is, of course, by trade. And so it's fairly obvious uh, that uh, free trade or trade, trade, certainly trade, but uh, free trade is, is, is more, as Smith said, is the solution to famine, not, not, not the cause of it. Uh, but uh, people, uh, if you read through uh, these various uh, books on famine, uh, this will be, tend to be overlooked, and they'll, they'll try to emphasise how wicked it is. Uh, people uh, want money to interfere with this rather than uh, just doing what people should do, and that's give effective relief and uh, effective, an effective dole. And uh, how wicked it is for uh, to allow uh, things to be exported when, when there's a famine, when uh, those things should feed the people who are hungry. Uh, there was a um, BBC television series called Blue Peter, I don't know whether any of you have seen it, where uh, good world presenters had a look at some of the problems in the world and solved them within a minute. You know, uh, and they solved them like saying, well, look here, there's plenty. They, they, they had a uh, Solutions like, oh, there's plenty of food in the world and there's people who are hungry there. Therefore, then, they just move the food to where they're hungry and the problem's solved. Now, what this overlooks, of course, is the problem of distribution. Now, distribution is very often the uh, better part of production. You know, as the old uh, uh, adverts for uh, beer uh, at home used to say, beer at home is not like beer in the pub, it's a different uh, product. Uh, and uh, you, you know, when you have a beer in the pub, you're paying for the furniture and so on, and the furniture might be down the pub and so on. Uh, it? And also, of course, the, you could make out the case for saying beer at home is nicer than beer in the pub. But wherever, wherever, wherever it is, they're two different products, uh, even though it's the same physical beer. Um, and the difference, of course, is in distribution. Now, uh, so. Uh, but I suppose the, the uh, looking through these are two modern books, by the way, the last few years published on fat. One is called *The Flea Famine* by uh, Thomas Killarney, an Australian Australian novelist behind the uh, Schindler's List thing uh, film, and uh, this is a book by, by one of the leading historians on this. Who started off in the Irish famine, but this is a book on famine in general. Uh, Cormac O'Brader, uh, and uh, he's been largely influenced by Martha Sen. <coughs> Uh, who's, of course, won a Nobel Prize since he made his uh, uh, celebrated uh, statement that democracy was the grand solution to famine. Now, uh, democracy, of course, is, uh, is an ideal, is something up there owing, actually, to the likes of James Mill and, uh, and the Bentham and people like that, the propagandists, the actual liberal, original liberal propagandists who were not only liberals but uh, also Democrats and saw no conflict between the two. Uh, how much there is a conflict between the two uh, ought to be made uh, clear. I mean, uh, democracy, of course, is uh, the use of proactive coercion, which, of course, is uh, politics, and, uh, of course, is to that extent, is illiberal. Uh, you might make a, a, a liberal use of politics if you were to negate some sort of uh, uh, proactive coercion. For example, if you were to vote for tax cuts, 
if taxation is uh, 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 practically coercion, so if you cut the taxes, you're, you're using coercion to cut the coercion to work to negate the negation, as old Ingalls said. And uh, so you, you could say that that's uh, you know, a peaceful use of, uh, or an almost apolitical use of democracy. But anyway, the, I mean, certainly, we're, we're, uh, I think in order to get, uh, when, there is a, when there is a consensus that the uh, that the uh, positive sum game, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, that is the market, is beneficial, and the negative sum game, that is politics, is a waste of time, when we get that coercion, uh, when we get that consensus, uh, as we might do one day, uh, then I suppose we'll have to make some use of democracy in order to uh, uh, get rid of uh, the state. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, the nearest thing to a peaceful way of getting rid of the state, I guess, so it's got some merit. You know, I would say half a cheer for democracy, or, you know, less than Ian Forster, who said, I think, one cheer for democracy, didn't you? Two, <laughs> two, two cheers, oh, well. <laughs> uh, Ian Forster said two cheers for, you know, I think, half a cheer for, for democracy. It, it has its uses, uh, uh, but uh, I don't think it's, you know, its uses to uh, the original liberal idea, the pristine liberal idea, uh, is uh, uh, some way off yet. The public opinion isn't on the liberal side yet. Uh, and so we have no use for democracy uh, in the short run. Although, of course, it, it, uh, you know, uh, the illusions, I mean, uh, uh, I want to give a talk on John Locke sometime. The illusions of, 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 uh, of John Locke uh, and the illusions of democracy uh, have probably uh, kept uh, the state a lot more friendly than it otherwise might be. So it's good, you know, give, I'm, I'm all in favour of giving the state a, a good name if it, if it somewhat lives up to it. <laughs> and I'm glad that the state is. The state could be a lot more hostile than it is, and, it, and it's good that uh, that it's that it, uh, it, it's as, uh, it's good that the state be as liberal as possible. <laughs> and it's, you know, uh, so uh, so anyway, Sen uh, said this about democracy. Now Kant earlier on went in for some actual Kant with a small C about democracy uh, being the grand solution to war. Uh, and this became popular in the uh, 1980s, but this was also uh, um, Kant, as I said, it's also uh, political correctness really in the colleges, and they like it. But of course there's nothing in democracy that will uh, solve war, and the prima facie is the case against it. Wars are very popular among the population, and they think they uh, can win them. And so this is a prima facie case against Kant. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, in any case, there were very few democracies when Kant was uh, uh, around, and uh, they, they were very they were very budding indeed. And uh, you know, uh, uh, extreme Democrats might even argue, and indeed uh, a lot of them do at the Students' Union, that, that Britain isn't really a democracy. Uh, so uh, you could say there isn't any democracy today. So he's uh, uh, going to go down that road. So basically, both this idea that democracy is a solution to war and Sen's idea of democracy is a solution to famine, both of them come somewhat late. Uh, uh, the last famine that Britain had was in the uh, 17th century and now as most books on famine, this book on famine here will say, uh, famine is usually expected to be a thing of very backward countries, uh, not, not uh, advanced countries like America, uh, Germany and so on. Um, and. Um, and the solution to this, of course, is, uh, is because they, these have established uh, trade, not free trade, of course, but they've established trade, and trade allows access to foreign markets, which is a grand solution to famine. Uh, so, uh, so this idea of the democracy uh, arriving as late as it did uh, is a solution to famine. It's a bit odd. But Sen makes a fuss about, uh, and so he should <laughs> you know, I don't blame anyone for making a fuss about famine. Uh, he makes a fuss about a famine in Bengal. Uh, in the 1940s, and we'll come on to that in a bit later, a bit later, because uh, basically Sen is the chap behind all this. I think he's the main chap. He, he, the idea might have been going earlier, but he's given it a lot of soccer. This business that uh, free trade causes famine. Um, uh, he's, uh, he wrote a, a very silly paper called Rational Fools. Every single line of this, I thought, was an absolute disgrace. <laughs> but but, 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 yeah, but yeah, you read and see what you think of it. Uh, uh, but anyway, Sen. But by the way. Tell you where it's due. If you ever listen to Sen when he's talking about imperialism, he, he always scotches the idea of other panelists when they start talking about uh, one country gets rich at the expense of another. He never goes along with that. In other words, Sen doesn't fall for the imperialist line, which uh, he would, I suppose, agree with Adam Smith on imperialism. Uh, uh, you know, 
countries don't get rich at the expense of another, and in fact they are imperialism is harmful to the uh, to the uh, ruling uh, power as well as to the uh, subject power. But anyway, uh, so Sam's all right on imperialism, and he's not. You know, he, he, he's a uh, he's a trained economist. He won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying the Nobel Prize is. Uh, Complete waste of time. Uh, you know, so so you know, Sen is uh, uh, you know, he's a bright lad, and, but uh, on this he, he seems to be uh, he, he seems to have really nothing uh, germane to say on the idea that, and of course the idea that it's an anachronism that uh, that democracy is the uh, solution to famine because famine was solved in most of the world long before democracy ever reared uh, its head, as it were. And uh, people even uh, writing in the. Uh, and the Irish famine, because it comes down a lot to the Irish famine <coughs> after a while, some of these discussions, which has got me into the Irish famine, which I didn't realise I'd be talking about very much when I first uh, started preparing this talk. As I say, I'm correcting, you know, I'm more or less updating things. I suppose I'm defending Smith against the college criticism of Smith, well, criticism which is welcome, of course, uh, but still, uh, it's wrong headed. Uh, so, uh, uh, so it comes down to the Irish famine, and many people writing on the Irish famine, including this chap, who's, I suppose, Australian, he came, his parents come from, it's an Irish name, completely. He, uh, uh, he can't, his parents come, uh, his great ancestors come from Ireland, I guess, perhaps he's even in the famine. Uh, so he, he, and he is fond of Sen as well, and throws him at length. Uh, so, uh, uh, so basically, uh, he, a lot of this, the main famine I'm going to, I was talking about famine in general, but the main famine I'm going to talk about is the Irish famine. I'm going to explain the Irish famine in a bit more detail than the other famines. But first of all, I'll touch on Bengal. Uh, a, a, a Sen uses Bengal as a sort of solution, a sort of a, a criticism of what I've said earlier on, you could say, because here in Bengal we have got a, a roughly a cash economy. And um, so why are they going into famine? And they, they did fall into famine. Well, uh, almost any account of it will tell you why. I mean, uh, first of all, there was a war on, and Smith himself, talking about famine, often says that uh, famines are made worse by war. And of course, they so often are. Uh, and Smith, by the way, makes a distinction between a dearth and a famine. A dearth is where the crops fail, and a uh, famine is the aftermath of how we react to this. And Smith actually says, as rudely as I might say it here, uh, you know, uh, if, people, if the government would just get out of the way and let people deal with the famine, uh, or deal with the dearth, uh, we wouldn't have a famine at all without free trade. It's a solution to famine. Uh, you know, and uh, of course, this is so rudely said in the wealth of nations that this isn't uh, liked by the colleges so much. Especially when they're all anti-capitalist and all, and they uh, don't think that the capitalism got any merit whatsoever. Uh, and uh, so uh, they uh, take this rude statement on, and uh, well, Smith uh, qualifies the rude statement to some extent. He'll say that, uh, uh, first of all, he'll say that wars don't make things any better, but he'll also say that various traders don't necessarily want to help out the people. They'll probably hold on for a higher price and so on, but they'll find that other traders will just undercut them and so on. And uh, of course, this probably would happen. But of course, in Bengal, this is exactly what uh, a lot of traders did. They hung on for a higher price. They, they anticipated the price to go higher. But of course, there wasn't free trade. There wasn't, there wasn't open markets. There was a war on. There was, uh, the Japanese was on the verge of invading. They invaded Burma and taking it over. And they were pressing into Bengal. And the British uh, didn't really even trust uh, the, uh, uh, the Indians and so on, because uh, the Indian National Party was uh, uh, talking about kicking the British out and so on. And so there's one hell of a lot of politics going on, one hell of a lot. And so the, the traders didn't have much competition from other traders coming in from outside and undercutting their prices, uh, because uh, you, you just didn't have anything. I mean, they do say that the first uh, tragedy of war is truth. But I reckon that uh, martial, uh, uh, martial law uh, gets rid of uh, free trade far, and liberty far quicker than it gets rid of truth. And so I think uh, truth is the second casualty, uh, not the first casualty of war. The first casualty of war is liberty uh, and the state. Uh, uh, and of course, wars, as has been pointed out in earlier talks by Stephen Berry and others, uh, war, war always gives an excuse for the state uh, to uh, make moral encroachments onto, uh, towards totalitarianism because it always thinks that uh, the politicians almost uh, think that, that to control everything is, is their game. 
Uh, and uh, certainly the, uh, the war gives them a good excuse to control a lot more of the economy. Uh, so uh, what we had in Bengal was nothing like uh, uh, a counterexample to Adam Smith. First of all, Smith, uh, uh, even in the parts that Sam quotes when he uh, criticizes Smith, deals had to put with Smith, and, and Sam, in my opinion, uh, Sam deals with Smith, uh, with, with, uh, Smith deals with Sam, beg your pardon. But Sam, in my opinion, doesn't have to put the deal with Smith. But, but uh, anyway, so the Bengal fa famine then is, is, is not an example of free trade causing famine. It's an example of a, a war economy where prices are fixed and where traders are trying it on and where there is no other traders to come in and uncut them. In other words, there's nothing like free trade there. Uh, and of course, it is a terrible famine. A lot of people get killed, up to a million get, get, uh, die from this famine. And the British government on and on, and they don't know whether they should help them out or whether they're enemies or and the, you know, the whole thing is a disgrace. But what do you expect in the middle of a wretched war? Uh, you know, this is, your war is a, a dreadful, dreadful thing and uh, it's people actively, <laughs> civilised, supposedly civilised people, actively killing other people full time. <laughs> Nothing could be more absurd. But, but, but uh, so, he, uh, so uh, I don't think that Sen does a very good job here, but uh, these people tend to think so. Uh, everyone knows why. They don't, they don't actually say why. Uh, but uh, so that's the Bengal. Then. So then there's the other thing that uh, is the sort of thing that we all think of uh, when we talk about famine nowadays, which is the Ethiopian famine, of, uh, especially of 1984. I wrote a political note on this um, uh, Ethiopian famine in 1984. Of course, then the uh, chief cause was war. And uh, there was, uh, B the BBC was actually reporting that uh, the Dutch were actually blowing up water supplies in Ethiopia, even after there had been a, a drought. And uh, I was saying to people in Birmingham, because Birmingham has its water supply uh, from Wales, you know, there's large water that's tapped from Wales to Birmingham, which is a big city in, in the middle of England. And of course the Welsh nationalists are always moaning about this. They've been moaning about it for ages. And uh, as I said to uh, the next door neighbors, if the uh, Welsh nationalists are actually uh, Blew up <laughs> the water supplies in Wales. We'd have something of a uh, something of a, uh, a water problem in Birmingham, in the middle of England. <laughs> Never mind that. Uh, you know, when you got a, a war, like a full-scale war, that you had on, in Ethiopia. But it's interesting to have a look at the population figures for uh, Ethiopia. In 1945, the uh, population of Ethiopia was five million. In uh, 1984 when there was all this terrible uh, stuff going on, and the, but by this terrible stuff is, is, is still going on now to some extent, as far as I can gather. Ethiopia didn't completely have peace. Uh, it's not as bad as it was, of course, but it, it, it's, there, was a, uh, there was actually a BBC uh, uh, program saying that there might be some more, family, uh, some more trouble there next year, uh, earlier on this year. Uh, so things aren't uh, calm there now, but uh, in 1984, the population levels was 55 million people. Now, in the census taken last year, in 1212, um, 12, the population of Ethiopia was 90 million plus people. That's a lot of people. So, in the terrible year of 1984, when there was up to 1 million people in trouble, there was presumably uh, 54 million people not in trouble. So, um, you know, it's not like the Irish famine, uh, where you had uh, uh, a population that had gone from about, uh, from about 1600 uh, up to about 1850, from uh, about uh, 2 million up to about 8 million. And from uh, around about 1800, it was still 5 million. And it got from, so from 1800, in that 47 years, it gone up to uh, uh, eight, uh, plus 8.5 million. You should try to, uh, and all owing to that wonderful top, the potato. Uh, the potato is far more nutritious than what you might imagine. It contains protein, it uh, contains calcium, it contains uh, uh, vitamin C, and, uh, and it's, it's got some, some other ingredients that, uh, that slipped my mind as far as I listed them. <laughs> uh, but they're, they're uh, pretty good ones, and, and if you mix it with the middle of bottom you can live on it. It's said again and again in various books, that uh, they had 14 pounds of potatoes a day. Oh, I'm well, as fond of potatoes, but I don't think I've ever had 14 pounds a day. And I can eat. I'm an exceptional eater. <laughs> I remember, I told you just a short, I remember when they had a, you can eat as much as you like place in Birmingham. Uh, this was, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, salad foods and so on. 
And I went in one day, and uh, when I went in the following day, they said, no, sir, you can't come in. I said, why not? They said, you had too much yesterday. <laughs> I, can eat. I can eat, but I don't think I've eaten 14 pounds of potatoes. Uh, but anyhow, they're supposed to have eaten 14 pounds of potatoes a day. It's said over and over again. But anyhow, they had quite a few, I guess. And, uh, and it's a wonderful crop. It's, uh, you know, it does, uh, uh, now, how, how uh, come that uh, you know, this population of eight and a half million uh, were, uh, that half of them were out of the money economy? Uh, how come? Uh, well, um, Cobden has a look at it, Richard Cobden, great liberal, follower of Adam Smith. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, he has a look at the fact. He, Cobden, by the way, is very much an anti-imperialist, being followed by Adam Smith. He thinks imperialism was a complete uh, waste of time. How did, uh, he did uh, coin this phrase, which, oddly enough, Disraeli, for reasons best known to Disraeli, I can't find, actually repeated just after making... Um, because Disraeli always was a bit of a prankster. There's a, there is a book on Disraeli, I haven't read it by Douglas Hurd, uh, which is supposed to be a disgraceful biography about him, but I think it's given the lowdown about him. There's a playboy more than a politician. And uh, I think there's something in it. Disraeli was a bit of a pl playboy. Uh, but anyway, he made uh, uh, Victoria the Empress of India, and shortly afterwards he repeated Cobden's words. Heaven knows why. And Cobden's words were, uh, levelled in the, uh, 80, in the 80, early 1840s, India is a millstone round England's neck, meaning that the empire is a pain in the neck to everyone, including the country which is supposed to gain from it, England. You know, and and she, you know, it's just a. Uh, and uh, this way, actually repeated this after making. Uh, this way, repeated in the House of Commons. India is, an Eng is a millstone around England's neck. I don't know why this really repeated that. But, 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 but uh, he did. And uh, it's in, it's in the, uh, if you have a look at Disraeli quotations in books of quotations, you'll find that attributed to Disraeli rather than to Cobden. But he, he, Cobden was the first one to say it. But anyway, uh, and we can understand why uh, Cobden said it, because he's an anti imperialist. He's, he's against the, the Indian imperial, uh, the England being in India. Um, so anyway, uh, Cobden had a look at this. And first of all, he, he thinks that. Uh, uh, England has held Ireland back with its imperialist laws, you know, the Navigation Acts and so on, doing no good to England as well as no good to Ireland or anywhere else that it tries to rule in this fashion. Uh, and, uh, uh, but then after that, he says, that, he says, uh, he says well, we're looking around the world, at looking at dire destitution. And there's, there's three places very famous for dire destitution. Russia, Turkey, and India. He says, going around Ireland, I found more poverty in Ireland than in those three places. You think that Ireland is even more struck by poverty than those three places? And, and he says he reckons it's unknown. He read the books of uh, uh, um, William Cobbett, uh, who did a tour on Ireland, and also a fellow called Henry Ingenis, who also did a tour on Ireland and uh, reported dire poverty there, uh, real dire poverty. And uh, uh, Cobbett is known to exaggerate these things. And uh, as Cobden says on Cobbett, uh, he, he, uh, he says, I don't think he's exaggerating very much as far as I can see. You also read uh, uh, Edmund Spencer, the uh, fairy queen, which deals, uh, Spencer spent a lot of time in Ireland in uh, the uh, Queen Elizabeth I reign, and uh, he um, commented, made some comments on Ireland that they have little meetings and so on, and they all, they all wear long coats, uh, you know, long max to cover up their, uh, their, 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 their ordinary clothing. And um, Cob Cobden said, when I was going around Ireland, I saw them having these little meetings just as, as Spencer had, uh, had talked about them. And I also saw them with these long coats. <laughs> so things see don't seem to have changed as many things, he said, that I read in Spencer some hundreds of years ago that I saw still in Ireland. He said, and uh, so uh, 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 Cobden says, well, what is the... So he says, it's not only the empire, where else is it? He says, he says, I think it might be Catholicism. So he does a, an analysis of Catholicism, quite a good analysis of Catholicism. He looks at Switzerland, where they've got 22 cantons, and about eight of these cantons are Protestant, about uh, 10 of them are Catholic, and four are mixed. And he looks at the uh, 10 which are uh, Catholic, and he finds them largely uh, agricultural and so on, and uh, the, the Protestant ones tend to be more to do with commerce and so on. And so he, he makes out a case that, uh, you know, he saw the old case that Max Faber later made a, a 
the president's ethic in the spirit of capitalism, I suppose, you know, the, 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 the presidentism is going to get, help people to go towards commerce and so on. And then he leaves Switzerland behind and goes to Germany and makes a similar case that the Protestants in Germany are more, prosper, uh, more prosperous and more commercially minded than the, uh, than the Catholics. And then he, he has a look at France and then he has a look at Italy and he says, if you note that the people who are uh, the uh, proprietors of, uh, uh, of places in Italy, they're usually Protestants. And he says, not a few of them are British. And so he goes through that. And then he says, when, he says, when I come back to Ireland, he says, even the, uh, the north of Ireland tends to be more prosperous than the south, uh, probably because of this president thing. So, of course, this um, is quite an informative analysis. It's quite, actually, it's quite impressive, really. Uh, I don't know how true it is. But I don't think it's completely true, because, as Cobden might have noticed, none of these places, Italy, uh, uh, Catholic parts of Germany and France and so on, only went here as backward as he said. The Irish are, and he's always said more backward than... And, of course, the three lands he mentioned, Turkey, uh, Russia and <coughs> India, they're not Catholic countries. So it can't be just Catholicism. Uh, so uh, what is it? Well, I tend to think um, that it is, in fact, uh, the Gaelic culture. Uh, the Gaelic culture was a, a strange culture. And uh, remember that all this prospering on the potatoes, uh, we did, no one had the, in fact, even when the potatoes failed in uh, 1847, no one knew they were going to fail for the next uh, four or five years. And it was one of the reasons why people didn't want to move, because you know, why lose your house and so on. Uh, Things might be better next year. No one, no, and and it's no use saying that uh, you know, that this particular uh, microbe that attacked the potatoes had been known before. It hadn't been known before. It it had only been its uh, its uh, head, as it were, in, in America, uh, just a, a few years earlier, about ten years earlier. Then it came to Europe, and then it spread across Europe, and then it finally got to Ireland. Uh, and uh, of course, all these books ask why was it that only Ireland starved, and you know, were England and uh, Germany and France and Holland who already had potatoes and so on. Why, well, we know the answer is because they were part of the cash economy and Ireland was not. They had cash crops and Ireland didn't. And so uh, they had access to world markets and Ireland didn't. Uh, but I mean, this is the elephant in the room, is why the people like him never, you know, this is lost on both these books and many others. Uh, you know, they just don't see this because they think that cash crops is a bad thing and capitalism is a wicked thing and so on. Uh, but but yeah, that's the answer. Uh, but why was Ireland a money-free economy? I think it's because of the Gaelic economy. Now, if you have a look at the part of the history of Ireland, um, the Romans, of course, never conquered Ireland. Uh, when St. Patrick uh, went there and converted them to Christianity, an odd result uh, occurred. They had a monastic society of uh, 150 monasteries, uh, uh, which were Christian, but the rest of the population weren't much affected by the Christians. And when this one chap, Columba, came over to Iona, in the islands in the west of Scotland, he started proselytising there. Why didn't he proselytise in Ireland? <laughs> I mean, there was no proselytising done in Ireland for 150 centres. And the, the, Catholic, uh, the so-called uh, Christians there were no more Christians than, than, than I am today. Uh, you know, uh, uh, but you know, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the people inside the monastery were Christians, but not the people on the outside. Now, uh, when, when the uh, uh, Vikings uh, con uh, came across both these islands, more or less conquered both these islands, uh, they uh, built cities. I mean, there were cities already in Britain. The Saxons had built them, the Romans and so on. Uh, but the Romans hadn't uh, conquered Ireland. And uh, the Vikings actually built Dublin, Waterford, Cork, and so on. The, the major cities in Ireland were built by the Vikings. Uh, the second lo uh, loads of cities, uh, Tralee and other places like that, were built by the Normans, who were Vikings who happened to settle in Normandy and learn French, and uh, we know they conquered England in 1066. And uh, so uh, the Gaels remained beyond the pile. You know, in other words, they didn't come into the cities ever. And they remained the cocoon. And it's this cocoon, this Gaelic cultural cocoon, uh, which kept them free uh, of, of the modern society, including the money society. And uh, this was so right up till the 19th century. Now, uh, and of course it kept them free also, and this is where I think Cobden's thesis completely fails, it kept them free of Catholicism. They were nominally Catholics, the Pope counted them as Catholics, uh, but they weren't very active Catholics. If you search for a Catholic priest in Ireland in uh, 1800, you'd scarcely find one. If 50 years later you search for a Catholic priest in Ireland, of course you find it teeming with them, but you don't have to go to Ireland to find a Catholic priest. You find one in Moscow, you find one in Buenos Aires, you find plenty in New York, you find them even in Peking. 
They were all over the world. It had been an explosion. This explosion of, of Irish Catholicism was, expected, in fact, the explosion of modern Ireland. It was the birth of a new nation, and this new nation had absolutely nothing to do with Napoleon or the Ulster volunteers of the 18th century, or with Wolf Tone, who they pay lip service to. It was nothing to do with Wolf Tone and the United Irishmen. It was born by someone who absolutely hated Wolf Tone, uh, Daniel O'Connell. Daniel O'Connell, in the monthly meetings, spoke to the Gales in English. Of course, they couldn't understand English. They had to have it translated for them. And in having it translated to them, they actually learned English. And in learning English, they broke the Gaelic, the Gaelic yoke, I've called it, and they came into the modern world and they joined the Catholic Association and won Catholic emancipation. And they became Catholic for the first time, which is why they're so enthusiastic. And Cobden going there says, it's a wonder sets after all these years. They're so enthusiastic, they're Catholic. We're not going to get rid of Catholicism there for a long time. And of course that's right, and we could have told him the reason why, because they're only just becoming Catholic. They're only just becoming aware of what Catholicism involves. Catholicism to them is a wonderful new thing, and it is a process of advance. So Ireland was more or less born then, the southern, the new Ireland, in contradistinction to the older and the old nationalists of Wolf Tone, who oddly enough uh, uh, would go up north. He came, he, uh, uh, Carson is like Wolf Tone, more, more like Wolf Tone than anyone really. Edward Carson, born and bred in Dublin, went up north to his form of nationalism. It's the older form of nationalism, it's the 18th century nationalism to Wolf Tone. That belongs in Ulster. That's what we call the Ulster man. That's the older nation. The newer nation, the Catholic nation, is completely and utterly different from that. And so it, this is the reason why Ireland had no money economy, because it, it was held outside the money economy. Now, because of the, uh, the potatoes, their population grew from, as I said earlier, from 5 million to almost 9 million by the 1840s. And, but half of them was outside the cash economy, no knowledge of money or uh, you know, just living from hand to mouth on this wonderful crop. The wonderful crop failed. There was no solution whatsoever to that except emigration. But of course they didn't know that emigration was the solution because they didn't know when the first crop failed that the crop was going to fail for five years. They didn't know that. And why lose your home, even though it's only a mud utter's come to quite rightly said he fed it back at home. Nevertheless it is your home, mud utter. My mud utter is better than you know a seat in the you know being a guest in Buckingham Palace, I suppose. But, but but you know, why lose your home as such as it is if you if it's only for one year's crop? Because uh, they didn't know. But but the actual thing was, if, if some if God had spoken to them, he might have said, well, look, chums, I'm going to tell you, uh, the top's going to uh, fail in the next five years. You're not going to build a network there with all the will in the world. Uh, you know, the, uh, any top sent to you will, pro will uh, rot, as they rot rot rotted in the arbor of Ethiopia when the band aid sent their drops there uh, in 1984, which is uh, modern times, right? And, you know, back there you know, in Ireland, uh, undeveloped Ireland, the top... It, 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 it's never going to be, uh, the, the donations are never going to get to you. You will have to go to the donations. So emigration was the only uh, solution. But of course, it wasn't seen as a solution because we didn't know that the crops were going to fail for five years in a row. So that's the tragedy of Ireland. Uh, it's not uh, the callous uh, Charles Revalian and all the other wicked British who hated the Irish as though they were some subhuman race and all the rest of the political correct nonsense. It is a tragedy. Uh, born out of a, an attack, a microbial attack, uh, that was unforeseen. So, um, but the, the solution to famine, of course, is free trade. With that, I'll hand it over to ah, some discussion. Very good, very good. Thank you. Questions, please? Real back. I have a question if anybody has one. Um, actually, part of the case that Amartya Sen makes uh, on, uh, for the famine in Bengal is to say that what happened is that when people anticipated that there would be a famine, the rich stockpiled and they bought large quantities of food, um, which dro drove up prices and meant that the poor couldn't buy enough food to live through the famine 
until the next Congress. And what his case was uh, is to say, if actually the government had prevented stockpiling, there would have been enough food. But because some took more than they actually needed during that period of famine, there was less for the other. That is the core of his argument. Um, that uh, now, of course, what probably you would say is, well, nobody knew how long the famine would last. Nobody knew whether the next harvest would be as bountiful as the, one this, uh, the ones before. So it was perfectly rational for people who had money to stockpile as much as they could. But what Amartya Sen says, well, fine, but if the government had prevented stockpiling, there would have been enough for that harvest. Let the next harvest take care of itself. No, well, that's not what I did say. If you remember what I did say in the talk. No, 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 yeah, but I mean, this is what, but, what, 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 I would, what I would say is exactly, yeah, I know, but you said you would say, but yeah. what I did say in the talk is what I'm going to repeat now, mm. and that is this if there's no war and no government, there'd be no problem. In other words, I'm saying that, uh, you know, because Smith also has a look at, you know, as I said, uh, Smith doesn't say, because Sen, I mean, Sen's, give credit where it's due, Sen's generous to Smith. He quotes Smith, and he, he and uh, it's a bit like Lenin on, on Marx in State and Revolution, when uh, Lenin's making a distinction uh, between communism and socialism that uh, Marx never made. Mm. Lenin's very generous, and he shows you, you don't have to read another text, State and Revolution is good enough even though he never completed the text, it's good enough for you to see that Marx never made a distinction between socialism and communism. Because mm. uh, uh, Lenin quotes, well, likewise, Sen on Smith quotes Smith generously. And uh, Smith, of course, is, is uh, notoriously aware that the merchants haven't got the best interests of the poor at heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knows that some of them are greedy and so on, and they want to make money and so on, they do the wrong thing, they're not uh, ideal people and so on. And, uh, and but the case that Smith makes is the case that I'd make. Free trade, not rammed up government and gov even worse, government at war with each other, mm. bringing about the very worst conditions. Uh, so that's what I said, and that's what I want to repeat. I wouldn't want to repeat that. I, I did say about the Irish famine that mm. there was ignorance, a lot of ignorance there. And of course there is ignorance in any market situation. That's the normal thing as well. Uh, but what I want to say is that, what, in my opinion, what caused the famine in Bengal was World War II, and especially the Japanese invasion. Mm -hmm. That is the biggest factor in it. No Japanese invasion, no famine. But I will, you know, it's true there were some black-hearted people there, and there were people who were indifferent to the Japanese. Not only indifferent to the Japanese, uh, as this chapter relates, you know, uh, the, 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 the person in charge there actually thought that the, uh, the, the Indians were all against British to a man and ought to be treated like, the Indians ought to be treated like the Japanese. Mm. Well, there's a sort of attitude you get when you're in war. Uh, war. I mean, war is, as I said in the talk, the absurdity of civilization working full time, killing other people. It's the exact opposite of trade. I shall, I shall uh, you say chairman's uh, prerogative here. Could you expand on something you said in the talk, which is that obviously the Irish lacked, lacked a money economy? We didn't fill in the details. What does this mean in the sense of, say, um, forward markets, regular fares, wholesalers, retailers, um, railways, roads, canals? All of those were lacking. And which is why I meant that the network, you know, what we had in Ethiopia, which I was shocked. I, mean, I think a lot of other people were shocked in 1984 as well. Looking at Ethiopia through the news and so on, what was happening in Ethiopia, people were going hungry. Is a band they were sending trucks there, there's food there, and the. the Food sent there were rotting in the harvest. Mm. And it was obviously, it was, you know, I was just working through some economic ideas, it was obvious that one of the biggest problems was the actual distribution from the uh, port to the actual place where the people were. Uh, of course, we you know, make a more detailed study, as he does, at and, and other places, and, you know, I've read other things on the he, And of course, you know, there was also the, the man in charge of completely limited moving people staying like into villages and trying to industrialize and so on uh, you know, you know uh, aping Stalin in certain ways you know uh, there's all sorts of things going on in Ethiopia but one of the major problems was the actual lack of uh, the sort of uh, economy that a free trade would have built up or that a free of trade would have built up and uh, you know, now of course uh, this chap who's a bit actually he's not too bad this chap he does point out that since the act of union which is 
All right, because he's certainly a complete national, Catholic nationalist. He points out that uh, uh, since the Act of Union, there was, in fact, some building up of the infrastructure. But there was nowhere near, you know, one or two railway lines, there was nowhere near the sort of uh, network system that you'd need to actually get the food from the, the, the uh, uh, east of Ireland to the west of Ireland, uh, uh, even with the best will in the world. Uh, you just that, uh, you know, because they, they, you see, they become totally and utterly dependent on the actual crop. So subsistence farmers don't yes. need roads. They don't need roads. Well, they're not buying stuff in, they're yep. just living on what they yes, make. Yes, and they're good enough. You can tell it, isn't it? In one way, especially to, to a modern person, famines are very strange things. We don't need that many calories a day. That's right. To live, it's a tiny amount, you know. That's right. And, and most, most of the mess are struggling with our weight, you know. Yeah. And that, yeah, I'm on the diet at the moment. I mean, you can't barely eat a thing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Can't oh, shed any weight, and you think how little food have you really got to have over such a yeah. And, and it's definitely a question of distribution. That this is the key. It's, it's, there's plenty of food about, it's just getting your hands on it. Now, normally that, uh, when you say you know you're, the premise of your talk is free trade called famine. Well, anybody with a modicum of intelligence would think no, it's socialism because you have you have to be nothing but the vast wrong-headed attempt to implement the fantasy of socialism. Can cause famine. Yes. Uh, the biggest famine is China under Mao. Uh, yes. Soviet Union under Stalin. Yeah. Or under Lenin. Or under Lenin, yes. <laughs> and um, Ethiopia, of course, itself, and vast swathes of Africa. Yeah. It's, it's all it's all this wrong headed, wrong headed attempt to implement the fantasy of socialism yeah. that causes mass mass famine. But the peculiar thing is, as you say, yeah, even even though there were you know, millions starving in these places, the population still going up. Now Ireland had always puzzled me, which is yeah, because that was a really a shockingly severe famine, and it, and it clearly wasn't an attempt to introduce socialism. Uh, and and I, I was just thinking, and obviously, but, it, but it's, it's not necessarily the introduction, the introduction of socialism, imposing, but that the culture itself was cut off from free trade and the market economy, which is the solution to famine, of course. And so this bizarre exile, and uh, you know, they didn't have the intelligence or foresight to sort of see the severity of it. And that's the sort of thing. Did, uh, normally, it's blamed on British imperialism. You, you rule that out. Is there anything that the British could have done? Oh, the no, British governing authorities could have done to alleviate it or make it less worse or anything? I agree with Cobden that the British government uh, uh, did a lot of things to help foster the situation that you've got. Mm. But I don't think that it, it uh, brought about uh, the uh, state that we had in the west of Ireland, uh, in, in the south of Ireland, uh, in, uh, in uh, 1847, I thought. I think what brought that about is they still. Uh, I mean, if O'Connell spoke 100 years earlier and woke Ireland up 100 years older earlier, and they started, uh, then I think you, you you wouldn't have had a famine in in the in the uh, you know, they'd have had the network and so on, and they'd have, they'd, you'd have had a lot of trouble. But I don't think you'd have had many people dying from it. And of course, if we had a, a if the tops fail today in Ireland, uh, you know, you'd just get a higher. Price rises in the shop. You know, perhaps not even a single person would die because of it. You know, so so you know, because they've now got the network. But you see, they didn't have the network. Exactly what Bob just said. Because they didn't need the network. They were the potatoes were good. Uh, there was no reason to think that they'd ever go wrong. And when they did go wrong, there was no reason to think that they'd repeat it five years in a row. And you could live off these. I don't know whether they had fourteen pounds of a day, but they certainly could live off them. Oh. Some yeah. well, they may have been per family, possibly. <laughs> and they had a pig. Well. They had a pig, and of course, they, they one of the problems with potatoes is they'd only store from six to nine months, and they used to keep this pig because they'd sell the pig then and uh, get buy with the, uh, the and this so far they were commercial. They'd sell the pig and then they'd buy with the uh, money oats and so on to feed, feed, feed them for the uh, three to four to six months, uh, so they get the next harvest and the next potatoes. So that's why they had the pig. <laughs> And, they, and when the harvest came, they would also sell some potatoes to get a, bit, a new pig. <laughs> uh, um, I would just like to elaborate on the point about the Ireland Act. Um, I think that you said how free trade is affecting Africa in particular. And, um, for example, African nations, I believe, when they, when they came out of colonisation, they needed some time to mature their own government system where when you have sort of Western countries who are coming in and then paying off these politicians for their resources and then it's not going back to the people where in fact it's just being enriching the rich of those countries and then they're imposing their rule of those people. I, I feel that that's the main problem with African nations. I no, I don't think that's a problem at all. 
You know, uh, now, uh, you know, you, you might, there might be something in there that you don't like, and something that we might agree on not liking uh, uh, in all that. You know, uh, but I don't think that's the problem of Africa. I, I think, first of all, I mean, I think a, a big problem of Africa, Africa is the taxi fly and things like that, you know, the, the, uh, which is a, bit of a menace. And uh, you know, it's very hard to, 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 to make much of it. But of course, we can, we've seen, we have seen that the, 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 the Africans are finally, since 45, thriving. Uh, one way or the other, and uh, I think that what, what they need, you know, there's too much uh, love of government in Africa. Uh, I happened to uh, bump into, uh, go to a college that was full of African students from uh, uh, around about 1970 or so, and most of these were quite high up in, uh, in Africa. They'd come to Britain for some reason, they sort of get advanced education and so on, but they were quite high up in the, in the governments. They weren't actual rulers, but they were high up in the hierarchy of these countries. And every last one of them were absolutely obsessed with what you've just said now, your government, 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 our own government, colonies and so on. That is all uh, bosh, really. That, that's, that, that is, that's not, there's no, you know, that isn't going to uh, butter any parsnips and say you still have a station. It's just, it's just that's, that's exactly what we need to get rid of. Too much politics, not enough trade. What, what is, what's productive is to produce something and sell it and then get someone to give you something which you'd like better than you. And that is productive. So when you buy something, you, know, you don't get uh, the equal of your money. If, if, if the thing was only worth the equal of your money, you might as well keep your money in your purse. You buy that something because it's worth more than the money, the radio or wherever it is, or even the Mars bar or a bottle of pop or whatever it is, it's always worth more than the money. So the trade is a positive sum game where it helps us both sides to get on, all traders get on, whereas politics is the very opposite of that. It's one person pushing the other person around uh, for reasons best known to himself, producing nothing, and uh, you know, just wasting everyone's time, as well as causing unnecessary pain in the world. So politics, I think, is bad news. Trade is good news. Trade is productive. Politics is uh, destructive. Can you have one without the other? Of course you can have one without the other. I mean, it's a bit like saying, uh, if I suffer from lung, lung cancer, what am I going to put in its place? I'm going to put nothing in its place. <laughs> you know, and of course I can have a healthy lung without lung cancer. Or if I've got a cancer, you know, uh, what am I going to put in its place? You know, of course, you, politics is a disease. You'll only be healthy if you get rid of it. I think the point is, would there be law... Would there be property? Would there oh, be police? Well, I hope there won't be. We, what we get from the present House of Commons in England, non-stop wretched legislation, all be wasting everyone's time. What, what we'll have uh, when we sort it, I mean, first of all, we've got to sort this out, which is exactly what we're trying to do here. Uh, and we'll have a basic law, basic law. So everyone will know what the laws are. You won't have to, you know, lawyer, a lot of lawyers will be out of business because there won't be much technicality in it. Basically, don't steal, don't murder, don't rape, and so on. And, and, uh, and simplify it down. The, the liberal thing to do with law is to repeal as much law as possible. And that is certainly most of the laws on the statute book of England and most other countries. They need repealing. And as soon as they can be repealed, the better. One question, sorry. Yeah. Certainly. In a limited would love a leader. What do you want a leader for? <laughs> Why do you want a leader? We don't want a leader. A leader, uh, you, know, um, you don't need a leader to govern your life. You, 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 you know what you want. As long as you behave peacefully to other people, there's no reason why you shouldn't have what you want. So how would we make decisions? Well, the way we make decisions now. I mean, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a writer called Michael Polanyi who wrote a brilliant book called Personal Knowledge. And in it, he, he tracks a joke. He says, today, uh, the UK government has shaved uh, 35 million faces and wa washed 60 million faces. Well, of course, the government hasn't done that. People have decided to shave or wash and so on. And uh, you, know, you, know, you don't decide to buy, you know, the government hasn't decided for you to buy that pup or whatever it is, or uh, you know, water or whatever it is, or, or for me to have water and so on. I decide that you decide what you do, I decide what I do. As long as I don't attack you and you don't attack me, what's wrong with the world? <laughs> You know, it's a, uh, freedom, liberty. Hey. Huzzah. Uh, <laughs> more questions? Sorry. Yeah, uh, one of the things, that there, is a, there is a particularly pernicious modern uh, ideological era really, called green, yeah, the green idea. And uh, it seems to be taken over by a lot of chefs who um, 
seem to think that what is a novelty for their restaurant would be cooked local food. Uh, yes. Things like that should be some sort of some sort of imposed national policy that we should cut out all this business of free trade around the world and rely yeah. only on what we can produce in as local area as possible. Yeah, keep so, cash out of it. Uh, so yeah, not, not just in the country, we should keep yeah. hacking it down just to the local area. Man. Yeah. All the time, what could make us more exposed to famine than that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it all, it's, yeah, what is just in fact a middle class eating fad? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> about, you know, oh, there's nothing better than a chicken grown in my own back garden, fed on, uh, fed on carrots I've raised myself or, you know, delivered from the local farm. Carrots? It's a middle class fad, uh, which is not going to. Uh, uh, feed the vast numbers of people in the world that there are today, which absolutely requires free trade to, to sustain this level of population. Yeah, uh, uh, it's a preposterous, pernicious nonsense. It is, yeah, but it's not. Every, uh, it's now too late for it to do any damage because no one's going to follow these fools to throw, <laughs> throw all their food in their back garden. So, you know, uh, I, I often read these books and they say these dang. First of all, I don't think there's anything seen as, and I don't think there can be any such thing as a dangerous idea. Well, silly idea. Uh, you know, uh, um, uh, but anyway, the people in the past who, who actually opposed free trade in the past uh, could do some damage to people because uh, they could stop uh, uh, free trade from g going ahead and so on. But now trying to reverse it, uh, you know, one or two rod bods will grow their own food. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I wouldn't be against it at all. A fair play to them. But they're not going to do any damage to the uh, vast population because the, the vast majority of people are not going to follow them to grow the, all their own food in the back garden. Have you seen energy prices lately, David? I mean, home produced energy is thought to be superior to, <laughs> even, you know, more virtuous. Yes. You know, your own, your own wind turbine. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, one question, obviously. Part of the problem with famine or, or, or lack of lack of lack of things could be not just food but also access to water. And I wonder, because obviously there's a difference of opinion but even among the libertarians as to whether you think that the last well in the, the only well in the desert could be owned by you know in, in private hands, uh, and whether they price water at, at any price that they wish to in, in a free market sense, or would you say in more of a Lockean type view that you know you could only take and as good. And then hence you can't turn around and monopolise the water. Well, I think it's, a, it's going to be a, 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 in the desert. There's not many people in the desert by definition. So, I mean, he's not going to sell much water in the desert. Uh, but, 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 you know, uh, you know, uh, I think, I think the, the example is, like many examples I find, I mean, I used to find them in Bernard Williams against the... Uh, I never was a Unitarian, by the way. But I used to find a lot of examples uh, by Bernard Williams, the late Bernard Williams, Shirley Williams' his husband, um, against Unitarianism, I found they're all fantastic, uh, 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 utterly unrealistic, and this is uh, a similar uh, idea. You know, I suppose you, you, you're really asking me whether my art's in the right place. Of course, my art is in the right place. Everyone's art's in the right place. Otherwise, they wouldn't function. But, but I, would, uh, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want a, a callous man to, to, uh, to deprive someone else of water. Of course, I wouldn't. Uh, but I don't think uh, that many of these are, are, are arguments against uh, libertarianism or pure liberalism, uh, are very good, are of a high calibre and, uh, and, and, and very realistic. I think, uh, realistically, uh, you, you, uh, people are going to sell out to, 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 to new concerns and so on, and, and, and uh, the people will be served by the market. They, you know, the market, profit, the so-called dirty word among these people, is your mark of, of public service. People are served when, other, when firms make a profit, and uh, you know, people gain by it, and no one's harmed by it. So, you know, so, uh, I, you know, so I don't, I don't think that, uh, uh, you know, I do think that obviously if, if, if one man uh, could uh, hypothetically get into a situation where he was causing the death of a lot of people through, then obviously the, the, the people would have to uh, take the liberal act of, of, of getting rid of him. But I don't think it would realistically arise. Would you, would you think, uh, Richard, that the Labour Party would be against free trade, I mean, we have a lot of, let's say, a lot of countries who have, for example, farming. Um, because the governments, Western governments or whatever, they, the rich governments are subsidizing their own farmers, so it's affecting them from trade, and let's say, mm. less of, of countries, that are, the poor country, the one who, who want to trade bananas, for example. Mm. They can't trade with that. Do you think that would be, like, against the free trade? Uh, well, it is, it's not free trade, of course. Subsidy isn't free trade. But I do think that uh, uh, the gains of trade are in the sale. 
So uh, if uh, some governments are subsidising, then of course they, they are uh, taxing people to do this subsidy, yeah. which is illiberal. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the, uh, the subsidies aren't preventing the other people from selling their uh, armed... You know, uh, there's less incentive, of course, but, they, but nevertheless, they, they, they can still do trade and still can gain from trade in spite of the subsidies. In other words, when you have the problem of dumping, what you're getting is other people subsidising uh, commodities going into the foreign market. So in actual fact, they're, they're, they're doing something which is uh, almost perverse. They're, they're giving you... Uh, free, they're giving the people who uh, are being dumped on free, almost free gifts or cheap gifts. And uh, you know, if, if the uh, population were flexible enough, they could take uh, that, uh, that gift uh, pretty freely, you know, or at least more cheaply. So the more, the more people subsidise, the more people... But of course what, you, what you're getting is things, things being subsidised that no one wants. And that's, that's rather silly. But you know, any subsidy, though, would be liberal because it would be taxing people which is on free, to, to subsidise uh, uh, some thing that some bureaucrat thinks is worthy of subsidy, not, uh, in spite of the fact that the public freely leave it alone, or you know, will not buy it so much as they would do in free circumstances. I think the point is also that a, a country that can actually make it better, and, or at least cheaper, isn't allowed to take advantage of its skill and its circumstances yes. to sell to the country that has the subsidies or the tariffs. Which is mm. uh, well, they, they, they are still... Uh, free, but they, they don't sell so many as they would do with free trade. Sure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, so it, it is true that it, I mean, it is true that the markets could be freed up to the benefit of all, and the freer they are, the better. And of course, they could, should be completely free. Although it is very uh, encouraging when you look in the supermarket to see flowers from, uh, you know, Kenya or yes. vegetables from wherever, and have flown in, you know, mm. which can't be very green. But no, it's not true at all. Who cares? One, one no. further, far fetched. <laughs> Questions. Uh, that's, what, that's what happens when you start reading uh, philosophy books. But, but would you turn around and say and another problem with with uh, free trade or, or privatisation, if you like? Some might turn around and say in another hypothetical far-fetched example to privatise the seas um, and therefore retrain you know, fishing rights to uh, say small islands can't access fish. Do you have any view on that? Or do you just think it's another nonsense thing like? Uh, same sort of example as I, uh, I don't know what will happen. It, it, it may well be that uh, that the seas will be privatised in the, in the long run. I don't know. I think it'd be uh, the seas are such a vast place and they're so, so unknown. Uh, you know, the, I think it's going to be a long time. I think I think we, uh, I, if I had a guess from now, after studying oceanography for a few years, um, I would say the moon is more likely to be privatised than the oceans. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, because we know more about the moon. But 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 yeah. Uh, uh, in, in the future, they probably might have lots in the sea. I don't know, uh, but I hope that this won't be uh, to do with. You see, because the nation state itself is illiberal. I think, you know. So uh, uh, I hope it won't be uh, government. Uh, you know, like because there was a. I, can't, I must tell an antidote. This uh, the the the, the, the um, anecdote. Anecdote. <laughs> big pardon. Uh, I'm a maltrop. I suffer from maltropisms. Um, uh, the, the, uh, there was a group called the English National Party. They weren't uh, fascist or anything. They, John Stonehouse joined them. And uh, uh, they were they're all fashioned and dressed up as beef eaters. But they actually did do an analysis of this Scottish oil business. And they found, ironically, that all the oil fell in English waters, the way things happen to me now. And I thought that was highly funny, considering all the fuss that the Scots were making about Scottish oil. <laughs> you know, it all fell. Unless they changed the water lines, which they, I suppose, could have it. As things stood now, all the actual oil fell in English waters, which I thought was very funny. I believe the convention is that where there's a major river entering the sea, the angle at which the, the river goes in, if it's on the border, that carries on up, and that would take the English right into the so so called Scottish oil. Yes. Uh, your question? Uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, just, just another angle on what you were talking about. Um, you know, historically, I mean, for thousands of years now, when you had the farm in, in the UK, I mean, this is natural forest land, and the forests were cleared thousands of years ago, and they had uh, the technology to use uh, certain farming techniques, right? crop rotation, for example, and leaving the land fallow. Uh, a lot of things they don't do now, and, and, and they're paying the consequences because you've got a crops which, which as you say, will take, in, uh, take certain amounts of nutrients out of the soil. Different crops take different nutrients, so that's why you need to rotate them. 
and you need to leave it fallow, and you need to use crops um, which are root vegetables, for example, completely different type of crops. But this has been on for thousands of years. Uh, well, it's always been practiced. Well, a lot, a lot of it came. A lot of it was. Uh, for, I mean, I don't know whether uh, it was known for thousands of years elsewhere. But a lot of this became public knowledge for the first time under Farmer George, because the uh, the uh, the uh, trays for farming uh, were in the so-called agricultural revolution, which was part of the so-called industrial revolution, <laughs> under King George III, who George himself became really interested in this. You've got people like Jethro Tull and so on, and Prof. You know, the various going into this, and a lot of that were, was all. Uh, fashionable stuff and all new stuff to the British anyway. Uh, now you might, write, you might well be right that a lot of this was known eons ago. And we, we know uh, that eons ago they smelted uh, iron and so on, copper and so on, and bronze and so on. Uh, you know, these people uh, were not all that, you know, they were highly advanced technologically, they, uh, you know, uh, even as much as, uh, you know, 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. Uh, uh, and we know stone ends and so on, that obviously took some sort of technical knowledge to yeah, so, but I, so I don't really know, but I do know that it, a lot of it was new to Britain in the tail end of the 18th century, crop rotation and stuff. Well, well I understand that I mean, the, the Romans used that kind of stuff anyway in their family techniques, but um, why, how come the, the, the Irish didn't take that up, even if there wasn't any infrastructure? Because I know that the same famine covered England and Wales as well, didn't it? But it, it, didn't, it didn't have the same effect because of the farming techniques No, not because of the farming techniques. Probably because, not exclusively. No, not because of the farming techniques. Uh, it was because England and Wales, and indeed France, Germany, and so on, where, you know, Spain, uh, you know, where, where we should, uh, the famine hit all of those countries. Uh, but well, I, over Europe, actually. Yes, that's right. But, but Ireland starved because uh, it was out of the cash economy, as I said earlier on. Mm. That's the reason why, it, and the reason why the, the reason why the, the real way, the reason why the Gaels didn't know of all these techniques was the, one of the reasons why they didn't know even about Catholicism or, or anything else because they weren't interested in culture outside the Gaelic uh, shell, as it were. They were uh, they were pleased with their own culture for a long time until O'Connell woke them up to Catholic culture. Bear in mind that this crop was only introduced into Ireland. When fairly recently, the, the 1590s, mm. it was, you know, they, they took it up as a crop. You know, they, they did. They soon took it up as a crop. Yeah, they took it up as a crop. Yeah. They prefer chips on mash. Yeah, it's quite. <laughs> 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 there, well, they, I, sh I should point out, just probably myself again, there was a quickly growing population partly because they could feed themselves. So all yes. You, all you did was a bit move further down, stop, have your own little patch. Yep. That, that was it. You, you had no cash crop to sell. You didn't need a cash crop to sell. You had, yep. you had your own crop to eat. That, that and the pig. Yeah. Uh, food security is potentially a criticism of the free market approach. Um, so on, on a free market system, if it's cheaper to import food, and we do that rather than grow it ourselves, we concentrate on building land rovers to South Africa, and they can sell us the crops. But what happens if... Uh, there's, a, there's some war or some incidents, and they don't want to sell it to them more than we're stuffed. And I'm thinking of an example, I think in Singapore, they, re, they don't have fresh water. They have to import all their water from Malaysia, which is a, is a different state. So if there were ever some kind of conflict between Singapore and Malaysia, and Singaporeans are stuffed because they've got no drinking water, well, it might make sense to them invest in some desalination or something, but that's well, not a market solution. It might, it's not the most efficient solution. Well, the, 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 the copper night answer, of course, is that this is a good thing because it, it's a disincentive to war. You know, we hated the idea of war. You know, the idea was free trade, we'd proud that war, the world would become so interconnected that people would be deterred from doing these sort of things because of the high cost of war. What the market does is make the cost of war more conscious to people and thereby brings about a, a, a situation where people aren't silly enough to go into this, which I think is the, the acme of human stupidity, which is full-time killing of other people. It should be said that's precisely what happened when the Japanese came down the Malaysian Peninsula. That's exactly what happened, yeah. That's, that, they that's had the water think, supply. So. That's, that's, that's why I think it's, you know, uh, the, the sand is, is you know, as, uh, 
free, you know, that's no criticism of free trade. I mean, you're miles away from free trade there. But Sen is, gen- as I say, Sen is generous to Adam Smith, and, and I think Sen's book is okay. You know, he's, you know, he's not a bad old chap, really, I suppose. Yeah, you, you need to be aware of those companies that are looking for uh, self sufficiency <laughs> and uh, autarkic uh, yes. uh, economic arrangements because they're the ones probably climbing the walls. A certain, <laughs> a certain uh, AH was rather keen on the idea that you could make everything you needed within your own territory. Oh, what? Well, or he, the territory you needed. He actually had the uh, idea that slavery was more efficient than, than, uh, than free trade and he wanted to enslave the whole of Eastern Europe. So he, you know, he would have actually ruined the whole of British Eastern Europe and ruined himself as well if he'd been, if he'd been successful. He'd have been unsuccessful if that's not a country. Well, the most well, contemporary example is that I think the North Koreans have uh, formally abandoned communism for something called Juche, which is self-sufficiency. And now we see that they're relying on themselves. They're starving to death by the, by the million. <laughs> so, that's, it's hardly any of them there, and uh, it's just it's just a relentless process of ongoing starvation. And their official state ideology is self-sufficiency. But it's the other is they're, they're permanently under war force, and they've got a massive army, and they're all starving to death. But it's the other is disaster. It's the other is who had all these terrible problems they've had have shut up. Amazing, ninety million plus. It's amazing. I think one last technical question from myself. Uh, it's been argued that um, because of the perfidious British. Um, and the Protestant ascendancy in Southern Ireland, uh, there weren't the property rights that there should have been, and, and people could not have. I forget how it worked. Leases, leasehold, yeah, whatever it was, yes. for more than a certain number of years, and therefore it wasn't worth anyone's while yeah. improving the property. Yes, that's right. And indeed, uh, instead of uh, primary gender, which we had uh, towards, the, I mean, the two things towards Ulster. One was the, uh, right, you could sell on the uh, improvements that you made, you could sell them on to the next tenant, tenant rights, uh, and it's tenant sales, so you can improve, improve and enlarge the property, which is one of the reasons for, between the North and the South by the two different economies. But in the South, it was the other way, you know, the tenants were split up into and shared among the family, so you're getting smaller uh, uh, farms, and people could marry sooner, which meant they bred sooner, which meant, and of course they had these wonderful potatoes, and had a nice family of 13 before you could say where you were. And that, that was good. I mean, it was all, I think it was all a good thing, but the point, is, the point is, is that this terrible five years in a row happened to be something that hit it, that no one could have foreseen it. To, and and so, so if you could have been foreseen, then the thing is to immigrate as quickly as possible, sell up or whatever, and get out to a medical or the kind of... See, and what is a, a paradox in books like these two, is that they say, they say, ironically, when the Irish went to America and Canada, they were just as abused as they were at home by the British. Uh, and so, we said, well, why didn't they starve to death there? And then, uh, we know why, because they'd moved to a bloody money economy. They had not, they had only the shirts on their back, but they had a money economy where they could get a job and get wages and start paying their own way. And they didn't have that in, in Ireland because they didn't have a money economy in Ireland, because they didn't need a money economy in Ireland as far as they could see. And that's the big, big tragedy of Ireland. Uh, you know, we, we, half of it, certainly the western and southern half, was out of the uh, money economy. And it, in my opinion, it couldn't have been helped with all the will in the world. What you'd have had is food rotting before it got to the people. What you had to have as a solution is the people moving towards the food. That's far more. That could, but they didn't know they needed to do that. Is the, is the terrain in uh, the west of Ireland particularly difficult to navigate? Rain, oh, terrain. The terrain. Oh, the terrain. Oh, yeah. well, there's plenty of rocks there and so on. I mean, yeah, it's very I rainy. The roads weren't good. And- all oh, the roads were, <laughs> but they weren't really roads at all. Yeah. No. <laughs> and, and, you know, no, uh, uh, but you see what Compton did, I mean, in, in, the, in his 1834 pamphlet, he'd seen an advert, advert in New York, and he said, this is a wonderful idea, why don't uh, this government, first of all, he, Compton absolutely hated it, I mean, lo- on the one hand he loved Parliament, he saw it as a talking shop, as a sort of a uh, college. On the other hand, he hated it because they were interested in every other bloody country in the world apart from this one that's supposed to rule Britain and Ireland. <laughs> and so he said, why don't they uh, take up this advert that's put forward in, New, in, the New, in some New York paper they found of using the Shannon, which is the biggest river in the British Isles, as the entry from the New World, so traffic coming from the New World would go through Ireland and on through England then and on to Europe. And that would have developed the whole of the... Uh, the Irish economy and, br- and brought them into the money economy. Uh, you know, he actually gives the example of when they did actually build a railroad into Scotland and the islands, which were a similar sort of, in fact, it's exactly the same culture because 
uh, I don't really know, but uh, you know, the Romans called the Irish Scotty, and the Vikings called the Scotty Irish. So Irish is a uh, Viking word for Scots. And the Scots did go into the Highlands, and they were in the Highlands. But anyhow, the railroad went into the Highlands, and he said after about 10 years, well, you know, from about 18, 10 on, uh, it civilised the whole, the whole of that particular route uh, along there, and uh, they were now uh, part of the, uh, the British Isles as they hadn't been. They, they were living in Antimouth, roughly as they were in the west of Ireland before then, and they ceased to do that with this one railroad through. So Cobden wanted plenty of traffic through the whole of Ireland, to bring all the people out, out of the, uh, into the money economy, and for once they were in the money economy, they were, they were in, like, if you like, like normal people, as Wolf Tone said they should become. <laughs> and he said, the, Wolf Tone says the Irish can become like normal people. <laughs> and and that's, that's what would have made them like normal people if they'd, if they'd been, uh, that, got that trade, that trade. Uh, I think that wraps it up. Don't we? Yes, yes. Uh, oh, one more. I, I think, you know, from Max Weber, it was very, I think the key things about um, the affinity between capitalism and Protestantism was um, the thing of instrumental activism and deferred gratification. So it's, uh, and it only, he only saw that with ascetic versions of Protestantism. Um, I, read, I read a book where they did a comparison of forms of Islam with ascetic, and there was a Japanese religion as well that they. Um, they looked at in terms of why Japan was such a successful economy. But in terms of the Irish and the culture, um, it's, it's almost like a, a simplistic view of, of, of Weber's um, thesis is the, like, um, in, in ascetic Protestantism, they, they, they deferred in gratification. So those peasant farmers, for example, would have been, they wouldn't have just had this unknown thing come because they would have been uh, putting, up, they wouldn't have been burning up their resources as they were going along. They would have been storing up things for the future. There's, there's some kind of anticipation, um, and, and part of it was the, what he said was the psychological insecurity of not knowing whether you were really of the elect or not. So um, you would you would um, basically be really hard on yourself and, and then uh, not not that. Uh, not too conspicuous consumption. Yeah, I don't. You know, I don't. I don't know whether the. Uh, I mean, what Cobden does do in his book he makes an impressive uh, uh, association between commerce and now whether Protestantism causes this commerce. You know, uh, I don't know. I don't know myself. I mean, I don't know what to make out of. I mean, I've read Max Faber's book, but I don't know what what to make out of it really. Uh, uh, I you know I tend to I tend to think uh, that whether. If there'd been no Martin Luther, we still have bad capitalism. You know, I don't think Martin. I don't think Protestantism is, is a cause of capitalism, uh, in that sense. I mean, uh, you know, uh, and I think the Catholics are. Uh, I mean, there's certain sects, the Jainists and others. Uh, you know, the, I mean, Catholicism is not homogeneous. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I was brought up in the wretched religion, so I know it's not completely homogeneous. In fact, uh, if you, uh, indeed, you could say that even Bolshevism is. That many many people used to often make a. a a parallel between Bolshevism and the Roman Catholic Church. And one of the parallels they make is there's so many different types of the wretched thing that really, you know, it's a bit like the, you know, someone says, that if you pick up the Bible, you can make a case for any, any, any uh, side from it. You know. There's all so many different things in the Bible that you can make. And similar with the, you know, the Bols Bolsheviks through uh, the various ideas, there's so many of them, you can almost get almost free market Bolsheviks out of them. And the same with the Catholics, you know. Uh, so the Jainists, in particular, are often cited as being puzzled like Catholics. So, so I don't know. You know, I, I don't know whether the thesis is right. Or, but as I said in the talk, I didn't think that Cobden was right on this thesis, although he made an impressive case. I thought it was the culture, nothing uh, which was not Catholic. You know, it was not only Catholic, but in fact, my opinion, they were not Catholics before uh, the 19th century. I think they, they, they were new to Catholicism uh, in the 19th century, in my opinion, in Ireland. So it's a new Catholic country. The new the new. 19, uh, I think I've got my dates wrong. 1870. I mean, uh, from, no, I mean, uh, from 1800, mm. 1800 onwards, mm. big part, a big part for that confusion. Uh, from 1800 onwards, uh, that's when they started to become Catholic, uh, more uh, de facto Catholic rather than just uh, de jure Catholic or, de, or nominally Catholic, real Catholics uh, after 1800. It's also their version of Catholicism and race superstitious rather than this thing of the, like the individual relationship between somebody who's chosen and his personal God. Oh, I think the whole of Christianity is... Whole, uh, 
The whole of Christianity is superstitious yeah, as far as I can see. Calvinism is specifically, supposedly, stripped down of it. It's very much like um, it's about individual responsibility. So every person has to be, you know, he's going to be judged. And there's a psychological insecurity thing that makes them, that really propels them to, to suppress their desires and to not dance and smoke and gamble and drink. And I'm, t- I'm, t- I'm just uh, guessing here, those peasant farmers probably, you know, they would just, if they had a bit of extra money, they would probably just drink it out or something. I mean, maybe it's not fair to say that. Uh, no, no, well, I, don't th- I, don't th- I don't think they, um, I don't think they did, you know, they made their own putting, of course, their own whiskey. Uh, but that wasn't nothing to do with... They didn't buy whiskey. They made their own beer and stuff. I, I think the point of your, your talk, in essence, is that the tragedy was that there was, no, there was nothing to save. That's right. Uh, they didn't... They, didn't the, they had no use for the market. It's a bit like the Chinese said to uh, King George III, you know, when, he, yeah. when King George III wanted to trade with China, he said, you've got nothing that I'm interested in. All this, you know, these toys you've sent me, they, they don't interest me. And, of course, he, he also sent him a lot of... Uh, Dogs, you know, with a lot of dogs. See, I ate the dogs, they're delicious. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I think we can close. Um, thank you very much, David. We're done. <laughs>